Well, thank you for having us back in your home this morning. We have a really exciting and intense presentation. I encourage you to get a pencil and paper. You're going to want to write down some of these passages we're going to be reading today. Some of them might surprise you. Some of them might give you tremendous hope. Some of them, I hope, will explain things to you of the complications of the world we live in today. So, jumping right in, our title today is Before Our Time There Was War. God's response to evil is the second part of our conversation since Satan was cast out of heaven and the fall of man has taken place. So, hang on, we're going to jump right in. Uh, the word iniquity in Hebrew means to be bent, to be crooked, to be broken. So the iniquity, the brokenness of Satan resulted in the earth immersed in a new culture, the culture of self and selfishness brought to us by Satan himself when he was cast out of heaven. It is who we are as human beings. Our immediate natural nature is to be self-preserving. Selfishness is at the heart of every single abuse, every single crime, every single war. Selfishness is at the root of all humanity in its brokenness. We're living in a cliffhanger. Is the real criminal about to be exposed? You see, God promised he would bring this self-centered utopia to its conclusion. Only one being is responsible for this entire rebellion. Now, this is illustrated clearly in the Old Testament in the Day of Atonement story of the two goats. But I also want you to pay attention because we're going to take that story of the two goats and we're going to give you what is called the rest of the story that is in Revelation chapter 20 that is parallel to that Day of Atonement story of those two goats. So hang on. It is going to get very interesting, I think, in our conversation today. So let's talk about God's response. He allows Satan to develop his principle of self on earth. Now, we blame God, at least for now, for everything. Now, this might surprise you. God is willing to accept responsibility for his decision, even allowing Satan to come down to this earth and to corrupt humanity. Are you ready for this? This is in Isaiah chapter 45, verses 6 and 7. I'm going to read it to you. That men may know from the rising and the setting of the sun that there is no one besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. The one forming light and creating darkness. Pay attention now vitally important, causing well-being and creating calamity. I am the Lord who does all of these. Isn't that a fascinating text? Remember, Adam chose in the garden the principle of self-love. Adam forfeited his God-given dominion over the earth. Remember, God gave him and Eve dominion to name all of the animals, to take care of the garden. This was paradise. But Adam simply chose to take the fruit and eat it, not even being tempted. And now we share in the manifestation of human selfishness as every single human being the children of Adam face reality in this world every day. It is our natural nature. It is who we are. 
So, when God resolves the conflict, as he promised, the result brings worship and praise. Did you know that he resolves this conflict in our lives today? We'll talk more about that as we get close to the end of our presentation. It says in Revelation 15, verse 3, they sang the song of Moses, the bondservant of God, and sang the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, O Lord God. The Almighty, righteous and true are your ways, the King of nations. When God resolves the conflict, there is singing and joy and praise in your life. If you will open your heart and allow him to come in and change your heart today. But we have more conversation. God tells us the coming judgment of the coming judgment for the sin of Satan that has been brought to the universe. God teaches ancient Israel the final outcome. So we know God has a plan. God gave a lesson to the children of Israel every year to help us today understand the outcome of this war, the war of selfishness. You see, when the blame and the guilt is placed on the scapegoat in the story we're going to look at, God is fully vindicated. Satan is responsible for the curse of sin and human suffering. And God tells us the, of the coming judgment for sin that is brought to us, to the universe. So the story in the Day of Atonement, pay careful attention. I tried to just be really focused on the story of the two goats. So you may want to read the entire chapter. It's in Leviticus chapter 16. It begins in verse 5. He shall take from the congregation of the sons of Israel two male goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. Then Aaron shall offer the bull for the sin offering which is for himself, that he may make atonement for himself and his own household. Verse 7. He shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the doorway of the tent of meeting. That's the tabernacle. Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats. That's where you take a white stone and a black stone. They're placed in a closed hand or some container, and someone then chooses one stone in the story, and the white stone will go to one goat, and the black stone will go to the scapegoat. In verse 8, it says, Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord, and the other for the scapegoat. Then Aaron shall offer the goat on which the lot for the Lord fell, making a sin offering. That's pretty simple so far, isn't it? Jumping ahead now to verse 10. But the goat on which the lot for the scapegoat fell shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement upon it and send it into the wilderness as the scapegoat. Follow the story so far? One is going to be offered as an offering like the lamb that you confess your sins on, a sin offering, sacrificed. The other is to be sent into the wilderness bearing the sin of the people. Pay attention now. Not terribly complicated. Now in verse 15, it reads this way. Then he shall slaughter the goat of the sin offering, which is for the people, and bring its blood inside the veil, and do with its blood as he did with the blood of the bull, and sprinkle it on the mercy seat, that is the Ark of the Covenant, and in front of the mercy seat, that represents the throne room of God, the confessed sins of the people being brought in to the throne room of God, in this case by the blood of this goat, the sin offering. He shall make atonement for the holy place because of the impurities of the sons of Israel, and because of their transgression in regard to all of their sin. So on the day of atonement, it's a day of eradication 
and the removing, if you would, of all of the sins of the children of Israel. So I want you to think about that for just a moment. What a remarkable thing this is. That once a year on the Day of Atonement, there is this service in which every single man, woman, and child, priest, priest family, everyone in this entire new country experiences their sins completely forgiven and removed, never to face them again. And it happens right in the presence of the throne room of God represented by the tabernacle and the mercy seat. Isn't that astounding? What a great day. Can you just imagine getting up from that service and walking out and, and just feeling the burden of sin rolled away? That you never face those sins again from the past year. They're completely gone. Every confessed sin is over. It doesn't exist. What a joyful, joyful day. Wow. Just let that sink in for just a moment because there's more good news coming. Continuing on, and thus he shall do for the tent of meeting which abides with them in the midst of their impurities. Verse 17, and when he goes in to make atonement in the holy place, no one shall be in the tent of meeting until he comes out that he may make atonement for himself, for his household, and for all Get this, all the assembly of Israel. It, I mean, this is just one of the most profound moments in ancient history for the life of every man, woman, and child in this experience. How important is this day? Verse 20. When he finishes atoning for the holy place and the tent of meeting and the altar, he shall offer the live goat. Then Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat, and, now pay attention, confess over it all the iniquities of the sons of Israel and all their transgressions in regard to their sins. So there was a sin offering of the first goat. Now notice the live goat. What is placed on this goat? Everyone's failure, everyone's bent, everyone's brokenness, everyone's iniquity is placed on this live goat. Fascinating, isn't it? Now keep in mind, there has been already a forgiveness of sins for all the people, but now they are taken and placed on the live goat. All of the iniquities, all of the bent, all of the brokenness, all of the failure of every man, woman, and child in Israel. It's powerful. And he shall lay on them, the, and he shall lay on them, I'm sorry, on the head of the goat and send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a man who stands in readiness. In the story, keep in mind, there's someone standing there ready with the rope to lead this goat out into the wilderness. Now, picking up verse 22 on your screen. The goat shall bear on itself all their iniquities to a solitary land, and he shall release the goat into the wilderness. Now, what I want you to understand is that in this ceremony, as all the iniquities are placed on this goat and the goat is led away, what is following that goat is the entire failure and sin of all mankind in that camp taken into the wilderness never to return again. So there's this, there is the sin offering and the sacrifice representing Christ. Then this scapegoat is taken out into the wilderness bearing the iniquities of everyone there. And those sins follow that goat out once a year 
into the wilderness on the Day of Atonement. And those sins never return. Fascinating story, isn't it? Let that just sort of resonate with you for just a moment. So let me summarize. One goat, the scapegoat, is the goat of departure as all, as all to go away and to disappear, followed by all the sins of the people. Fascinating. The blame is placed. Here he is to die alone in the wilderness to bear symbolically being responsible for all sin being taken away into nothingness representing the end of the self-love utopia that Satan and his third of the angels of heaven brought to this planet. The end of it is told in this story. As the people watch that goat taken away, responsibility for the failure of humanity, they were free. They had been forgiven. They had experienced that blessed gift of God. Now, does Satan have authority on this planet? Does his authority qualify him to be responsible for the sin that we experience in life every day. I've got two texts on, or two passages on the screen, actually. I want to break them out so you see. Uh, I'm going to take you from Luke chapter 4. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led around by the Spirit into the wilderness for 40 days, and he meets the devil there, and the temptations he faces. Now keep in mind, that those temptations, he was allowed to tempt Jesus because he was the prince of the earth and had the authority to tempt Christ. There's two passages. I combined the two, John 12, 31 through 32, and 14, John 14, verse 30. Now, let me just read them to you. Now, judgment is upon this world. Now, the ruler of this world will be cast out. Who is that? That is Satan. Verse 32, And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. Then 14, verse 30, I will not speak much more with you, for the ruler of this world is coming, and he has nothing in me, Jesus says. The accuser of the brethren has nothing to accuse Christ in. I want you to know there's a perfect parallel describing the actual story in prophetic language. God holds Satan fully and completely responsible for his iniquity, his brokenness, his utopia of selfishness, of self-love, and the destruction it has brought on our planet. The story is in Revelation 20. I hope you're paying careful attention. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key to the abyss, and a great chain was in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. The artist has conveyed this picture of him being bound on the planet Earth after Christ has taken his people. Judgment has fallen upon the Earth after the plagues fell, and the Earth is desolate. And Satan has a thousand years bound to this planet to see what his selfishness has done to humanity and to God's creation here. A thousand years to ponder his rebellion. You want to talk about timeout? Yeah, God uses timeout. In this case, he gives him a thousand years of timeout. Continuing on in verse 3. And he threw him into the abyss and shut it and sealed it over him so that he would not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were complete. After these things, he must be released for a short time. That last phrase we'll talk about in another conversation. The scapegoat in the wilderness 
all alone, bearing responsibility for the sin and destruction brought to planet Earth in Revelation chapter 20 as he awaits the final acts of judgment. There is a gospel solution to our selfishness that we are gifted with as the sons and daughters of Adam. First of all, God is selfless love. Agape is unconditional divine love, the very basis of every act of God. It is given in a living demonstration in the life and actions of Jesus. It has been gifted to you and to me. It is a gift to us in Christ. You want to talk about transformation? It is a selfless love that transforms the human heart and the human being. That is what Christ does for us, for you personally. So in the Great War, the conflict of good and evil is real. Satan governs on the principle of self. Self is the underlying principle of our society. But Christ came to this earth to establish his kingdom here. His founding principle is the opposite. It is agape love. God's love gifted to us freely. And he will fill you completely full. He will work every day to eradicate that selfishness in our human heart. The cross, in the midst of this conflict, returned the entire human race back to God. The cross delivered all mankind from Satan's dominion. I will read you the texts. John 12, 32. If, and I, if, I am lifted up from the earth, will, what? Draw all men to myself. There's more. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish. But what? Have eternal life. Can we just pause here for a moment? Do you really understand the simplicity of the language of this passage we are looking at? First of all, it tells us how much God loves this world. So much that he gave his only begotten son. He gave. Notice who's doing the giving here. It's God. He gave his only begotten son. What? So that if you or I or any of your friends or family or neighbors ever believe in him, that we will not perish. We will not face that judgment. But what's the end result? That we will have life without end to spend eternity in the new creation with God. Isn't that just amazing? So do you understand the centrality of the cross in this story? If I am to be lifted up from the earth, what is Christ doing from the cross's perspective? He is drawing all men to himself. All men to himself. That includes you. That includes me. John chapter 5, verse 24. Let's walk through this one carefully. Truly, truly, I say to you, in other words, I'm telling you the truth. He who hears my word and believes in him who sent me, that's God the Father, has eternal life. Now, isn't that just profoundly simple? Satan comes and he makes life complicated because gratifying yourself is not an easy thing to do. It is a complicated life to live a selfish life. But did you notice the simplicity of how God resolves what the rebellion Satan brought to the universe? Agape love is God's gift to eradicate the selfishness of the human heart. 
Agape love is God's unconditional love. God says, I love you irregardless of all of your past behavior, and I'm giving you a new life today. That's agape love. Exactly the opposite of selfishness. And then he empowers you with that love. And believes in him who sent me, continuing, has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life eternal. Is that your reality today? Are you a willing recipient to say, today I choose to accept that Christ has drawn me, he has accepted me, he has forgiven me, he has taken all of my sin, and he's pouring his unconditional unselfishness, his unselfish life into my life, and it has caused me to pass out of eternal death into eternal life. A death from which there is no return into a life without end. Powerful. Good news. I want to take you to our closing picture here in our last few moments. Uh, first picture was Death Valley. This also is Death Valley as well. Isn't that just rich? I mean, I want you to notice all of the date trees. I mean, those aren't just palms. Those are date palms. Uh, that's the Chinaman's date farm, just not too far from Death Valley. I hope you take a moment and enjoy that. But I, take, I just want you to take a moment today and enjoy the goodness of the gift of God's agape love poured into your heart into your life, setting you free today in Christ. Blessings.